Hey, Mike, how are you? I'm pretty good, man. How you doing? Doing good. Thanks for uh, joining me on this. I really appreciate your time. Oh, very happy to. I love the game like you do. So <laughs> anything we can, we can collaborate on, it's a good thing for everybody. I was trying to, I was thinking about this a lot and, um, you know, we've been filming the documentary. We started 2019 and well, yeah, 2019, uh, December. Yeah. So it was right before the pandemic went into full effect and, um, we were filming everything 4k slow motion. It's beautiful. <laughs> and we got like three months of shooting in and then everything shut down. And since then, it's, you know, we've, we've, picked up some shoots here and there, but it's it's really slowed the pace. And so the question's been, do we incorporate this element into the documentary? If so, do we incorporate Zoom footage into it? And we're still on the fence about it, but I figured with this at the very least, like this is just good content. Um, and if you're comfortable with it, we can put it out on the Facebook page and people can can watch it and just hear more about your book and about the film. You know, it could kind of work both ways. So what brought you to New Hampshire? from the Detroit? Uh, pretty much radio. i am uh, been a radio now almost 51 years and the, the radio business is uh, very transitory. So I graduated from college in Detroit, worked in Toledo for a bunch of years, moved to Washington DC to work on the nation's first all comedy radio station, then up to New York City for a while, then Boston and now New Hampshire. Been in New Hampshire for 23 years, but New England in general, which I kind of consider my home state, even though there's six of them here, uh, since 1984. So 37 years I've been in New England and, um, you know, which is over half my life now from, from the Midwest. So um, that's how I got here. Now, do you have a memory of the first time you went Kendleton bowling? Uh, actually... Not specifically, uh, but it was at Acton Bolodrome in, in Acton, Mass, um, which is where I did my first 10 years there as a league member. Then my job changed and I, I had to leave the league. I do remember my first time at six years old as a 10-pin bowler, though. Uh, uh, that was, I mean, that is so vivid in my mind that I'm sorry that I don't remember my first candle pin time. But I do remember my first 10 pin bowling at age six was a candle pin score. I had 36. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. It's probably what I get as an adult. So <laughs> now what, what do you think it was when you started candle pin bowling in contrast? Um, you know, if you had a choice, do you, would you choose one over, over the other? Um, I, you know, I love both games. Remember I grew up doing 10 pin. And until I was 34 years old, I never heard of candle pin bowling. So when I moved here, as I mentioned, there, there weren't that many 10 pin houses near me. And I saw candle pin bowling on channel five. And, and uh, I said, you know what? You know, I got almost a 200 average in, in 10 pin. I'm not going to get any better. Why not try something new? This is a really cool looking game. So that's what I did. And I, and I loved it. And as I mentioned, I met a lot of great people. I joined the amateur Canopin tour. So I got to do some competitive bowling, uh, won a title doing that. Uh, and, and I just, I loved them both. And I would do both equally uh, if time permitted. And of course, with so many bowling centers gone, it really is hard to conveniently find a place to bowl that isn't a long drive. And that, that is the most heartbreaking part of this whole progression to me is that just so many bowling centers are just going out of business, not only candle pin, but 10 pin and duck pin. It almost seems like part of the culture is just kind of floating away, which is the, one of the main reasons I, I did the book, Lunch with Tommy and Stacia, because I just, I didn't want all those stories to go away. Yeah, we do have a lot of the matches on YouTube, but they don't tell the whole story. The whole story has to be gotten by sitting down and talking with people and recording conversations, you know, like you are with me right now, so that there is some record of the backstory of what made the game great. Yeah, it's very competitive, but the people that were professional bowlers had really interesting stories and they were just everyday ordinary people. And I always find ordinary people's stories more compelling than I do famous people.
That's why I love the, the Canopin people that kind of took me in and because I hosted a TV show for almost 10 years, you know, they trusted me and they opened up to me and became very friendly with uh, all the, the top names or those that had time to talk to me. So with all the interviews we've conducted, it seems to correlate this period of time in the industry where the culture was shifting, you know, whether it was video games coming out, who knows, you know, the involvement in the game declines, but it also coincided at the same time with it disappearing from TV. And through your research, did you, do you, have you made that connection? You are 100% right about that. It, uh, it, it, it kind of left commercial TV in the early 2000s. Uh, there were a couple shows that were still on, but the Channel 5 show went off in 96. The show I did went off in 2005, and then I did it for one year on Boston TV on WLBI with Frank Malicote, Candlepins for Dollars. That left in 2006. The, uh, the show on Comcast had a run for a few more years. And that was it. And I think you talk to any proprietor, they'll tell you they saw a decline in, in bowling lineage as soon as those shows went off the air. Because you know what? You'd, you'd watch the show on Saturday at noon, at least here in, in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And then all of a sudden, people started showing up at bowling centers, you know, like minutes after the, 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 uh, the, the shows were off. And, and today's young bowlers, like guys your age, probably missed that, that part of it. But the ones like, like Jeff Surrett, he is just old enough to have remembered that. And that really inspired a, a, another generation of, of bowlers that are really very good. But what happens after that? What happens to their kids? They don't have a, if they're not watching it on YouTube or you know on whatever streaming, you know, I don't know what's going to motivate them other than, you know, parents keeping it going, you know, like, like your daughter, I would assume, will probably be exposed to the game and you'll bring her out and she'll love it. But there's just fewer and fewer people your age with, as you pointed out, video games and all the other forms of recreation. It, it's just another thing to do. And it's not as special to uh, enough people as it used to be. And that, that makes me sad. It really does. Yeah, and I'd like to just share my little personal story with bowling on TV, where as a 11 year old, I'm working my way up, you know, bowling in tournaments and just having a great time. And I had an invite to bowl um, on TV in Augusta at 1710. And I moved, I moved like an hour and a half north. And it, it coincided around the same time I was supposed to go bowl. And I had to pass my invite on to another kid who was you know, second in line at, at my bowling house. So I was that close to ending up on TV, but I think it was probably maybe a year after that, that it's, they stopped airing it. Um, you know, so we, we've seen that, that period of time for the industry and it really struggle and the impact that that's had. Do you think we're going through a similar thing with COVID or do you think maybe bowling alleys have learned to be a little more resilient um, through those times of trouble? COVID hasn't been helpful. Can't lie about that. Although I don't think we can really hang this whole decline in bowling on COVID. It, it was a setback, but, um, but there have been some bowling centers that have, I think, really stepped up their game during the COVID crisis, one of which is um, Boulderama in Portsmouth, which I assume you're familiar with. You've probably been there. Uh, the Maderos family has really taken it upon themselves to not lose anything if possible and to keep the game going with momentum, new leagues. I mean, before COVID hit, their league bowling was on the increase, which is totally upside down from most other bowling centers, losing leagues, but getting more open play. So uh, unfortunately there aren't enough Bolarama type places, but there are some that are really trying to, to hang on there and, and kind of, be flexible and do a quick pivot and find ways to bring people in. And, and I think now you, you can do that. There's fewer restrictions on, on uh, mask wearing and, and other stuff. So the, those that survive will, will, uh, will thrive. The question is, are there enough people that want to bowl on leagues that is for many the bread and butter of their business? Because open play is not. Open play prices are way too low, although the, the bowling public thinks they're way too high because for too many years,
the bowling proprietors were afraid to raise prices when they really could have because there were so many bowling centers and so many bowlers, but now it's really hard to do that. And the public is resistant to two or three dollars or five dollars a string or whatever it is. And that's not helpful. So you really got to give them not only bowling, but you got to give them some other good spiffs like, you know, good restaurant food, some entertainment, a really nice looking bowling center. Walking in and, and going to a place that smells like smoke might be cool to somebody my age because, oh, that brings me back to my childhood. But for, for somebody who's got a, a young daughter like you, you don't want to smell smoke. That's, that's, not, a, that's not cool. So it's yeah tough. i mean that it brings back those memories of having to go get my dad because it was his turn to bowl and i had to open up the smoking <laughs> room <laughs> it's just the smoke pours out and i peek in i'm like dad are you in here you're up um yeah and it, it kind of correlates right with this uh revamping of the the industry and you know as the the face of it right they go from being a bowling alley to a bowling center and it's a place that's they're taking it out of the gutter and it's no longer uh, smoky. It, it, now it has the arcade and it's got the restaurant. Um, we've seen that transition. And, you know, I know for me personally, setting up to do the documentary, I really wanted to tell the story of like rural bowling alleys, or at least what happened to them, because they were, I feel like hit the hardest. You know, if you're near the city, you still have somewhat of a population. Although real estate, right, you're talking about not charging enough per string. And you're talking about a bowling alley that's a massive building with real estate costs going up. There's other things that could probably end up there and make a lot more money. And it all comes to mind. I remember being in Philadelphia and there was Lucky Strike Bowling there, 10 pin. And I found out how much they charged per hour to rent the lane. And it blew my mind because I grew up, it was $1.25 a string. <laughs> you know, you combine that with uh, the, uh, what is it called? Brooklyn Bowl in New York, where they have the concert venue and bowling. And it's, I it might be like at least $50, you know, to, to get a reservation there or something like that for a game. Um, it's, it's wild. So it does seem to be that disconnect with, uh, you know, New Englanders, I think maybe being very frugal and <laughs> not used to paying lots of money for things like that. Um, and, the industry kind of having to adapt and change and, and be a little more flashy. Um, so, and all of your visits and, and going to different bowling alleys and seeing them, you know, what's that, what's, what's a, an impression you have from that, that, you know, the ones like Bolarama that have been able to adapt, you know, where, what do you think maybe sets them ahead of the curve? They realize that if you don't change, you're going to be out of business. And I'm afraid that for so many years, uh, some of the proprietors did not uh, upgrade, did not improve, did not make any changes because they didn't have to. Now, with so much competition, with all the other things people can be doing, you take a place like Bolarama, you can do more than one thing at Bolarama. The old timers, kind of like me, although I don't put myself in the mindset because I like to think I'm a little more progressive thinking, but the old timers don't like rock and bowl or atomic bowling. And I got to tell you the truth. You know, I don't typically enjoy that, that kind of bowling, but if you want to bring in the new audience, you need to be doing those things. And those that have made the changes are, are doing okay. Another example is a Wamaset lanes in, in Tewksbury. It's a split house of 10 pin and candle pin, and it's pretty flashy. And I think they've got, a really nice restaurant and maybe even a little movie center. And I've gone to a number of um, bowling expo events, which uh, were out in Vegas for a couple of years and just observed the way that 10 pin bowling proprietors are changing uh, because their, their sport is also in somewhat peril, but it's still very competitive and they really work hard at staying ahead of what the public wants and giving the public what it wants, which is more than just bowling. They want a full entertainment experience. And I think for too many years, Candleton Bowling didn't realize that again, because it was so good, they didn't have to make any changes. People would just open the doors and they come in and they hand your money and they bowl. But now it's not that way. And so you actually have to make an investment and, uh, and, and you should, I think bowling 
Cantlepin bowling proprietors should attend some of these expos to see what Ten Pin is doing, uh, if, if they can afford to, but I don't think they can afford not to, quite honestly. And I think Bolarama realizes that, the people at Wamaset Lanes realize that. And I haven't seen too many other places because I just haven't traveled to many bowling centers over the last couple of years. Now, Blake, with that in mind, we've kind of had a different answer from everybody we've talked to. But in, in your research, why do you think Candlepin Bowling stayed local to New England and you know, certain parts of Canada? Have you discovered a, a reason for that? I really, I really haven't. I think um, some of it has to do with, with the equipment. Uh, I think Scott Moore, Scott Moore is, uh, is a really smart guy. He works on the machines and I think he has some thoughts as to the scale of economics of, of Candlepin machines and, uh, and equipment and stuff like that, that, you know, it, it's above my, my pay grade. The real easy answer is that, you know, 10 pin bowling really blew up in the sixties because of the national uh, television shows that were on different networks, but mostly ABC, the Saturday afternoon show that was the, the PBA tour. Uh, and now it's it's still on in some form. Candlepin bowling never really got uh, a chance, or the country never got a taste of of candlepin bowling. And even if they had, there were no bowling centers to go to, so you could watch uh, a candlepin bowling match and be really jazzed by it. But if you're living in Salt Lake City, there's no candlepin bowling. So, uh, you know, I'm not. There's no finger pointing going on here. It's just the way the game evolved. Ten pin was already a bigger game, and the networks saw that and they went with it. I think candlepin bowling could have done just as well, but it just wasn't in the cards for any national exposure, sadly. Then beyond that, as far as building the bowling centers, I think somebody like Scott Moore and probably Bob Perel, I'm not sure what he said, but I know he's got very strong opinions on why it never went beyond pretty much the Hudson River for the most part. Yeah, and you're, I think you're, you're somewhat spot on with that in terms of the equipment. And a lot of our research has basically shown the the lack of ability to, to purchase the stuff, especially brand new. Um, we're we're talking from the the pins being manufactured in Saco and that, you know, essentially being done by one business. And then mm -hmm. on top of that, not being able to get these machines purchased new. So when a can open bowl and alley goes out of business, they buy up the machines, they put them in storage, they hold on to them, and um, you know the I, it's. As much as as an audience, we'd love to have an easy answer as to this is why it's very complicated. And I think there's multiple factors, but one of them certainly is um, profit and businesses um, realizing that, okay, there's more money to be made in the products that are being used on a daily basis with 10 pin versus some of these machines, which you can go into a candle pin bowling alley in Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and those machines are original and they're still yeah. running to this day. And um, that I think is a it's a double-edged sword, right? Where it keeps keeps you know your your business going, but at the same time hurts the overall business because there's no resale value of of machines or parts and things like that. Um, yeah, once, once those machines finally bite the dust, uh, and people like Scott Moore are helping to keep them alive, and he is a dying breed of candle pin bowling mechanics. His son Cam, who now is probably 20 or 21 is taking at least last I spoke to them a couple of years ago in his father's footsteps <clears throat> but there's just a handful of people that can do that and Scott is in such demand you know some of the new flatbread lanes in, in suburban Boston which are restaurant entertainment centers bowling theaters pool rooms you know he's he's got a good gig going but you know he's not going to live forever and Cam isn't going to live forever so uh, the economics of it is not uh, is not real hopeful. I'm sorry to say. And you know, on top of that, if you're a young mm -hmm. business owner and you're contemplating taking over one of these bowling centers, mm -hmm. you have to basically be a mechanic to work on these things. You know, it's not you have to learn the ins and outs of running a business successfully, an entertainment business, and then also managing these machines to be able to work on them on a daily basis. <laughs> that's a that's a tough role to fill. Yeah, I couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, me either. Um, 
So why, like, why, what do you think makes Candlepin unique? And this can be a personal opinion, like to you with the sport, um, especially in contrast to, to those who are just familiar with 10-pin bowling. I, I think it applies <clears throat> to all kinds of bowling. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I think Candlepin bowlers always felt that their game was special, and it is. And I think that people in this part of the country felt very territorial. They felt very defensive when 10 pin bowling got all the, the glitz and the glamour and now it's on Fox and everything else. And I, you, you talk to anybody and they say, oh, 10 pin bowling, it, it, it's such an easy game. Well, everything is relative. Um, it's hard to be a good 10 pin bowler because the game has really ramped up in terms of scoring. And that's what people hate about it is because a 300 game, which used to be a once in a lifetime thing for, I mean, I never did it and I was a really good bowler, but I was bowling in the day when the lanes weren't blocked or dressed the way they are now. Um, I, I just feel like 10 uh, Candlepin bowlers are really very possessive of their game and they, they, they circle the, the, the wagons and, you know what, this is the greatest game ever. And, and I get that. And it is a wonderful game. Yeah, but there's other games out there that are also very wonderful in their own way. But I do love the passion that New Englanders have where pff, temp in, I'd never do that. Well, have you ever tried it? It's actually fun. But Candlepin is, is very special because it's a harder game. You know that. I know that. And it's much more difficult to really have a, a good average. So you have to really just work at having fun in the game. And if you have the time to practice and get really good, that's wonderful. There are fewer opportunities though for really good bowlers today. And that's what makes me sad too, is with the TV shows gone, that means the purse money is not there. Pretty much any money that, that the bowlers are winning and, and you see them, they're streaming all the time, which is good. I loved it when I'm going through my feed on Facebook, I'll stop and watch something for 10 or 15 minutes, see if I know the bowlers. But, but the money that used to be there because of all the sponsors that jumped in besides the bowling centers isn't there. And, and those bowlers deserve to have bigger purses to play for. But you know what? They're the ones that they're playing with their own money in this particular case. And, um, and it's, it's such a unique and such a much loved and passionate sport or variation. Uh, you know, I think that's what makes it different because knocking down pins or sticks or whatever you know, it, it's, it's the concept of this is our game and people really cherish it and really aren't interested in hearing what 10 pin bowlers have to say because it's an easy game. They say. And I think they take great pride in watching those, especially I know this happens at Westport, um, just outside of Portland, where mm -hmm. the 10 pin bowlers come in um, after bowling during the tournament there and they go to bowl candle pin. And I think there's a lot of enjoyment in watching them struggle <laughs> trying for a straight ball. You are so right about that. Ha ha, Mr. 300. Good luck getting a 95 game with our, our version. Uh, I would love to see some money matches and I'm sure they've happened. From time to time, where a Jason Belmont, who the, the two-handed superstar, ten-pin bowler, would maybe take on, you know, somebody from from Maine in a in a in a side pool match. I'm sure that's happened. I'm not aware of any of it. But part of when I did the book was one of my favorite parts was was getting the stories of the actual money matches, the purse. I guess they call them purse matches, where. Uh, there'd be thousands of dollars changing hands, not only between the bowlers, but the people in the back betting. I mean, back in the 60s and 70s, that was a big deal. And probably even into the 80s, where there were huge matches, you could hardly find a place to sit and watch a Gary Carrington uh, take on a Chris Sargent or somebody like that for big money. Uh, much of it was theirs, but sometimes it was backed by, by other people. That's the stuff that should have been on TV. Um, but you know, you have to be polite and, and, and nice and you can't use, can't drop F-bombs on TV. So uh, that, that's one of my, that's, and I think that's still going on to some degree, but that's kind of what's happening now on the streaming matches. It's those kinds of, um, that kind of vibe that, that's happening. It's sort of like money matches, but now we can all watch it if you've got an internet connection. But without money, it really can't 
advance much beyond where it is right now. So, I mean, I always tell people and they say, well, let's get Canopin Bowling back on TV. Well, find somebody that has some money. Make friends with, with somebody that, that loves the game, has had a huge career in some industry, has millions of dollars in the bank, and have them bankroll a season or two because I got lots of ideas on how to make it really good. But you need the money to do it, to, to get a, a, a larger audience. And you need to make it a different kind of production than it used to be. Just three games of Canopin Bowling and the Total Pins wins. Now you need to do other things with it. And, and, uh, and to, to, to further on that, like, is that the audience that you need for the future of the sport either? I mean, are younger kids watching local TV on Saturday mornings? You know, and that's a that's a very real factor. Yeah, they're this is this is what they're doing on Saturday morning, you know. Mm -hmm. Video games, <laughs> you know? Netflix. Yeah, we're absolutely. all doing that. I'm watching TV doing it sometimes and I hate myself for it. It's like, <laughs> can I just focus on one thing? <laughs> Not <laughs> no, anymore. Yeah, CNN.com. All right, who's doing what? Like, no. So, so yeah. just talking a little bit more about good bowlers, can you um, tell us about the subjects of your book that you interviewed and spoke with um, and just maybe give us an overview for those who aren't familiar with them? Well, I tried to, uh, and this was a challenge, I tried to get to as many big names from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s that I could, interview them, get their stories, and the, there were two challenges. One, people sort of forget things as time goes on. So I could talk to a couple bowlers about the same incident and get widely differing takes on, on a particular match. That's because we just remember things differently. The bigger challenge was getting to as many bowlers as I can without hurting anybody's feeling, feelings because I didn't call them. Now, I know a lot of the bowlers, and I got to as many of them as I could, but I didn't get everybody. And if, if I would have tried to get everybody, the book wouldn't be out yet. So I actually did hear from, from one bowler who I should have talked to, but I didn't know him and uh, just never had the time. He wasn't upset, but he said, how come you, you didn't come to me? And I said, you know what? I don't have a good answer to that, except that I just ran out of time. And you absolutely deserve to be in there. Uh, he was a guy that was on the live Channel 5 show on a number of occasions, and I felt horrible. And I even, I think in the beginning of the book, kind of gave myself a disclaimer that there's way more bowlers that I could have gotten to, but either time ran out or I didn't know them or, or whatever. So, uh, you know, for, for instance, the, the lunch with Tommy and Stacia, Stacia is Stacia Zernike. Uh, the greatest woman bowler, for the most part, I think most people would agree that, that ever lived. She had an amazing ability. If she were still alive, she would be 100 years old, actually. I think she would have turned 100 last May. And the, the, the Zernike family had, was really the, the linchpin that got everybody interested in, in the game. So um, Ed Zernike, the surviving uh, son, one of two sons still alive, handed me a stack of scrapbooks. I mean, it was massive. Thousands of articles. Tony Zernike, the husband of the late Stacia Zernike, and he's also passed, kept every news clipping from, they lived in the Worcester area in Webster, and he gave me what was what I would consider gold, a gold mine. And it took me months to go through and and kind of find some of the stories. And, and so the non-Stacia stories are because Tony saved all the newspaper clippings. So for those that are old enough to remember Stacia Zernike, I really wanted to make sure that she got her just desserts in terms of her stories. And Tony and Ed shared a lot of that with me. And I tell you, I was a nervous wreck because I had in possession five of these massive scrapbooks in my house. And I prayed every day that my house didn't burn down because you know, it was like, this is the Smithsonian of Candlepin Bowling, the, the books that the Zernike family gave me, and they were so wonderful. Then Tommy, Tommy Olsta, the other namesake of the book, I went to Florida where he and his wife live and, and spent some time at their house, and they brought out all kinds of, of things. So I had the foundation of the book with the two greatest bowlers that I think most people would agree, the goats in their respective um, 
uh, genres. And then I went from there to, to, pe to talk to people like, um, you know, um, Paul Berger, who had the 500 triple on Channel 5, and Tony Marie Baldinelli, and, and the list went on and on. And these people just opened up and they shared stories that the average viewer wouldn't know because there was no time to talk about their personal lives very much. So that's what I loved was finding stories that people probably never heard from, I don't know, 50 or 60 bowlers that are that I interviewed. And there's another 50 or 60 I could have gotten to. But I mean, the book as it is, is like, um, you know, 250 pages. And I, I felt that people really appreciated the stories because there hadn't, you know, I see over your shoulder there, the, the, the book that Florence Greenleaf did. And that was kind of the standard for many years and kind of still is, but it's of a generation now that, that people largely probably under 40 can't really relate to. They don't know them. And, you know, and this book will also eventually fall into that category, but I won't be around to update it. And I hope somebody does because now internet bowling is kind of replaced television bowling. And there are stories, you know, I've been to the, to the worlds and I've interviewed uh, some of the young guns as I call them, Jeff Surrettes and Dave Godwin and, you know, uh, Barber and, and there's many, many more. And I just hope that somebody doesn't let that all slip away uh, and, and does kind of a follow up to my book, you know, in five or 10 years. Yeah, and I, I can totally relate to you on that aspect because when we launched this project, the intention was to do a short film about a main Candlepin Bowling Alley and tell their story and kind of overall share the story of Candlepin Bowling. Um, but we were funded by a main endowment for the, uh, for the arts and oh, that, um, that kind of helps keep it local yeah. here. So we started running into some trouble where we wanted to tell this bigger story. And obviously, like, as you mentioned, people are very protective over this sport and they, they want to be a part of it and they want their story told, but it's going to be impossible to please everyone. And I almost feel like releasing this film, there's going to have to be a disclaimer, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. and number one, it's going to be like, this is about Maine, you know, and I know the sport was created in Massachusetts and there's some of that in there, but this is local to Maine. And it, you know, on top of that, it's a 25 minute film. <laughs> There's only so much we can share, you know, and we wanted it to be, be, be bigger. And it, it looked like it was going to skyrocket to a feature length film. And then the COVID pandemic hit, you know, there's just like, we were trying to go to Canada for a year and we just couldn't, we couldn't do it. So yeah, I can totally relate to you on that aspect and feel like <laughs> maybe there needs to at least be a disclaimer on the can open chat post when we put it up there like hey don't rip us apart like everybody <laughs> has a story to tell and we just found a few that we wanted to share i don't think anybody will rip you and quite honestly i haven't had one complaint my another part of my fear was that i was just going to get some some facts wrong and, and and i mean i probably did in a few places but i also went to a couple of people that i consider to be really keepers of the stories in their brain. One of them is uh, Irby, John Kefalos. And I had him read the manuscript before I submitted it uh, because I trust him, him and Scott Moore, the two people uh, you know, that are a little bit younger. And they pretty much signed off and said, yeah, I, I, think, I think he got it right here. Well, I got it right because I, the book is strictly on interviews, not so much about me remembering stuff because I wasn't living here. Uh, until 1984. So I, I think uh, a disclaimer is good. A certain amount of humility is good when you acknowledge that it's impossible in 25 minutes to tell the story. And you do have to go beyond the borders of, of Maine because Maine is a part of this great game called Candlepins. You know, Maine is really a, a major player in, in the game. And, um, but you also have to give it the context of, of the bigger picture. But you can focus on Maine, but there's a bigger picture beyond Portland and Westbrook and Augusta and, you know. Absolutely. Like and I, I think, um, you know, there's, as an author of a book and, you know, even with you doing TV as a director of a film, it's almost your job. You're learning this stuff as you're digging in, right? You're learning the facts and you're trying to almost become a professional 
or an expert in, in the subject yourself in order to tell that story accurately. So there's a learning curve. And, you know, when you're going up against um, the, your audience, you're putting stuff out there and these people are experts, they've lived it, you know, and it's, it's going to be easy to see at times when you're maybe, you know, not making a mistake, but learning as you go. And the humility is an important part of it. Um, but I'm of two beliefs. One is that people just love hearing more about Candlepin. They love seeing the sport get more attention. So, you know, there's that working to our, our benefit. And if we're just setting out to grow the sport, if we just want new people to hear about it and come to New England and play, then everybody should be, you know, stoked about that, right? Like, as long as we're, you know, our target audience, yeah, we want to please the people who have bowled their whole life in Candlepin and they get to see that story on the big screen. But we, our audience also is really people who've never even heard of it. You know, if- uh, Yeah, and you, you've got to grow an audience of people that aren't necessarily interested in, in being professional bowlers. They're the ones that are the most enthusiastic, but if, if, if the game doesn't scream fun, then eventually once the, the interest in professional bowling and the side matches and the, and the, uh, the games that we see online now um, streamed, then that's it. it. It has to grow beyond what it is right now. You have to imagine other people that have never even heard of it. You somehow have to, to draw them in and make them want to come into the place, not because you're knocking down pins, but because there's it's, it's fun and there's other fun stuff to do. There's a good meal to be had. There's gonna be a band here on Friday night. I mean, this should be like a diner is the heartbeat of a community. Well, I think Canton Bowling Centers used to be sort of the heartbeat of the entertainment community. That has to come back in that, in that context. It's not just about who can uh, get a 700 uh, series for five games. It's, and that's great and it's a wonderful achievement, but it's really about families and about entertainment. And uh, I think that has to kind of be the, the goal here. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny, I wrote another grant proposal uh, shortly after we were funded. Um, so the film was funded by the Maine Arts Commission through the Project Grant for Artists. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to spread this out even bigger. And I was starting to really see a different level of this as being not just a film, but something to experience in terms of, can we put this on a little kiosk and put this in the Portland jet port? And it make it, you know, interactive where they can click like the history of it, um, you know, the greatest game ever bowl, the best bowlers. And while they're waiting for their flight, they're learning about this sport, you know, and so maybe that's the future of something we can do with it um, and have a traveling exhibit. But yeah, so, you know, it's important for me, like, as a, as a filmmaker. I want to present visuals that are stunning. I want to pre present like a story that's captivating. And I want to tell something in a unique perspective. And so you're balancing this element of, you know, putting out this information that people have cherished for so long and they get the opportunity to see it on screen, but also creating this, you know, great story that captivates somebody who knows absolutely nothing about it, or maybe heard it one time when they summered here in Maine and it's on their next to-do list. And, you know, I think it's definitely possible and it's been fun trying to figure that out. Um, but, uh, yeah, and that's also comes down to it just being a shorter film, you know, that's, it's, it is what it is at this point, you know, we could keep dreaming and keep going bigger and it, the fact of having to table this for another, you know, three years and just slug away at it, I, yeah, I think it's at the point where it's, it's going to be beneficial to, to put it out there, especially at this time, right, like, for this sport to have new things coming out um, at a time when, you know, they've had to adapt a little bit through the pandemic, I think, I think could be beneficial. When uh, do you expect that your film will be finished? So we're hoping um, December to wrap up production. We have one more shoot actually next week. And then, then it's pretty much pickups after that. Once we get into the edit, what do we need here and there? Mm -hmm. um, so really that would give me the very beginning of 2022 to start editing and get a, a good solid first cut done. And then we have to make a decision. Do we want to do the festival circuit or do we want to do like homebrew premieres? And there's pros and cons to both. That's going to be an interesting road to navigate. Um, and 
you know, there's, like I said, pros and cons to, to both, like the Simpsons, right? They featured can open bowling. And I feel like that needs to be in it, but good luck trying to get the rights to that. I was going to ask you about that uh, because in my book, I actually interviewed the, um, the producer of that episode who is from Watertown, Massachusetts. And he's like one of the big producers of the Simpsons now. And he gave me some great stories and he was really interested in the book. And I would encourage you to send him, you know, a, a copy of your, uh, of your film when it's, when it's finally done, because he mm. loves the game. And that was a great episode. And uh, he was such a stickler for detail that he told me his budget ran out before the episode was completely in post-production finished. And one thing he was upset about is the color of the bowling balls. Uh, he wanted them all to be kind of the usual dull brown or, or blue or whatever. And, and whoever was in charge of coloration for, for those segments was using all kinds of wild, crazy colors, which of course we do have now, but he wanted it to reflect an older, an older time. And um, it, it was interesting to hear him talk about the little he wanted it the details to be just right. And, and I think he nailed it pretty well. I can't think what his name is. It, it's in my book, I'd have to look it up. But um, but some some of the festivals like Camden Film Festival, I'm sure is gonna be much more stringent on being, on using other footage. And so, you know, to me, uh, I just want the story to get out there um, and whatever the best method for that is. So if it's not the film festival route, then, then so be it. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting aspect of making a film that, you know, I wouldn't say it's the fun part. <laughs> so I don't know if yours is more historical in nature or is it more cultural? What's kind of the vibe of your film? Yeah, so we, like, the idea was that we're focusing on Bolarama in Sanford, Maine with okay. um, Owen and O.J. Martin. So it's a great yeah. dynamic there, right? Well, you have his father who's took it over from his father and then you have the younger generation taken over. Mm -hmm. So that was the initial idea. And then we have a segment where we interview Bob Perella and some other people where they talk about the history, where was it invented? And, mm -hmm. and, um, and then a few uh, different bowlers who talk about the TV segment. And, um, you know, so there's some historical, there's probably a good chunk of the middle part of the film that's historical and giving some context as to um, the TV and then the downfall with things, you know, bowling alleys <laughs> closing. And then we go back to just the personal love for the game. I think that's probably the, the over um, arching dynamic, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's a definitely a blend. We had to have the historical aspects for the audience who doesn't really know what the sport is. And right. um, I also wanted to provide um, my own answer as to why it's just in new England and parts of Canada. That was like, that's our secret, right? That's our secret sauce for it. Like, we have an answer. It's our own answer. I don't know if it's right or not, but um, this could maybe help give some different perspective on that. And then um, at its core, like my concept for the film was having the ability now to shoot slow motion 4K footage with all the technology that we have, um, go into these bowling alleys, these bowling centers, and capture these elements and just and just stunning visuals. And it was, it's easier now than it ever was before because usually it's very dark. It's, it, it's not that bright in these bowling centers. And um, we took vintage Canon lenses. So we're talking about film lenses from the 50s, the 60s and the 70s. And we have adapters and we put them on these 4K cameras. So we're getting these just wow. awesome um, vintage looking shots that the colors are just, they, it matches the the seat benches, you know, and the the paint on the bowling return on the ball returns, um, and that's the juicy stuff for me. Like, as a cinematographer, I love getting into that, um, and then combining it with the story. Um, it, it's it's been fun, but yeah, that's I think at its core, it's it's hopefully just going to be a, a beautiful visual piece um, about the sport in a way that we haven't quite seen it yet. Well, I, I can't wait to see what, what you do with it. Uh, you know, I'm like you, except my medium is, is the printed page. <clears throat> I'm, my current project is 
there's a diner in New Hampshire that's known nationally called the Red Arrow Diner. It turns 100 years old uh, next October. So for the last two or three years, I've been researching that the way I did the Candleton book. And I just came to the realization recently that I'm going to make it more a book about a collection of stories and things that have happened there versus a real strict historical, you know, there'll be a timeline and some other stuff. And there, there's some history that you need to put in there. But I'm not going to, I'm not even going to use the word history now. It's, it's, it's not going to be in there because there's a lot of room to make mistakes. Uh, especially I'm not as comfortable in the diner uh, world as I am in Canopin Bowling, where I can pretty much be authoritative on that. So it's really, it's a, a similar kind of book as The Lunch with Tommy and Stacia, but it's, uh, this, this is the diner that is the center of the New Hampshire primary every year. Uh, Adam Sandler is a regular there. And so there's just shitloads of, of celebrities that go in there to, to see and be seen. And then there's just the, the everyday blue collar slubs that are in there and their stories are fascinating. So, uh, and I've been given a lot of access to different things, but I got to work on getting the permission for some of the photos that, that I have from like the local historical society and, and things like that. But I can make any decision I want because I'm not being underwritten by anybody. It's, it's my dime. And then the publisher of course will pay for it, but all the, the pre-production and every the research is is on my dime because I want it to be my way. And, and so I, I assume you, you want to be able to make sure it's your take on things, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, it's in line with what you're talking about, right? When you walk in there, there's a vibe, there's a feeling, and it's a combination of nostalgia and sensory overload. A diner is very similar to a bowling alley, lots of smells and colors. Yeah. Um, and trying to capture that is not necessarily done in a historical format. It's, it's in the stories and the, the, what all these different experiences that lend themselves to those memories. And, you know, both, both um, mediums, I think can lend themselves very well to that. Um, yeah. So I, just a quick question before we start wrapping up and okay. off the top of your head, do you remember what's the highest candlepin game you've ever bowled? Uh, it was 157. Uh, now my, I don't know, my lifetime averages for the 10 years I was on a league, I averaged anywhere from probably 100 to 107. So I was a little above average bowler, but the, the great thing about the 157 string, and then for my high triple was 382. It was in a, uh, a tournament, a pretty sizable one. Uh, the amateur Canopin tour. I don't know if we ever came to Maine or not, but it, it traveled around New Hampshire and Massachusetts. It was a handicap based tournament. And it was for guys like me that weren't good enough to be in the pros. But with handicap, if you have a good day, you can, you know, and, and the money in this tournament was was better than the WCBC Pro Tour uh, because there was so many more people and it was weekly instead of monthly. So for this particular tournament, which had a really good turnout, it also happened to be at my home lanes. It traveled all over New England but it was at my home bowling center when I bowled uh, that. And I ended up winning that tournament that weekend. It was like $1,100, which is like, wow, that's like one of the highlights of my life um, to, to bowl way out of my ass to get handicapped and to do it in front of the people that know me. It was, it was quite a thrill. So yeah, so that, that's a long answer to what was your high No, seat. that's, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Have you ever bowled with uh, wooden pins? No, I haven't. Not that I know. Of. Oh, it's a big difference. It sounds different. I had a chance in uh, near Worcester a couple years ago. There was a, a church, and a lot of a lot of places had Canton Bowling Centers in the basement. Yacht clubs, senior yeah, center. The Sanford Town Hall had it in the basement. They, did they? Mm -hmm. And some of those places, I think, are still there. All probably three inches of dust on everything. But this 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 church in uh, whatever town it was friend of mine who's a writer in Worcester said, hey, I, I'm going to be able to go in there. You want to come? And we get to set our own pins. And they were wooden pins. So we were setting pins for each other. And the sound is so different. And scoring is way lower, which uh, maybe you've, you've heard about that in your, uh, in your production. Mm -hmm. But there was a great resistance to changing from wood to plastic. Because a lot of the old timers felt it was just like 
giving up, it's going to make the game so much easier. And it did, it did bring averages up probably maybe five to 10 pins. Hmm. But one of the drawbacks in Candleton has been, it's so hard and people don't get the gratification that you do. So imagine if we were still using wooden pins, first of all, they <laughs> screwed up the machines because they splintered and they jammed the, the, the pin setters and stuff. But you can actually, this is like a mint condition pin, never wow. been used. And there you can, you can see some of the, uh, I think it's Brunswick. So uh, what's really interesting about these pins, and I take them because I, I do a lot of speaking. And when I speak about the book, I bring a um, pin like this, and then I bring a, a plastic pin. And I tell people that I have three wooden pins like this, and I weighed them because a, a candle pin is supposed to weigh two pounds, eight ounces. So the three wooden pins I had were like two, five, two, four, two, seven. They all weigh different. You want to take a guess why that is? Well, different types of wood being used, uh, hardwood versus, you know, different types of hardwood uh, or age, age as it dries out. There you go, as it dries out, because wood obviously is, has a certain moisture content. And as the years go by, some pins, depending on the wood, although I think they're supposed to be made out of the same material, the, the, the water eventually just goes out of it. Like, like when you're drying a firewood, you, you can yeah. when you chop it. So I was shocked to see the weight difference. Uh, I mean, this pin is probably over 60 years old. So there's been a lot of evaporation going on. <laughs> yeah. So. And you know, you're talking about the sport, you know, growing. And if you want to have regulations and tournaments, you need consistency. And that is not the way to go. <laughs> no. You know? yeah, the I remember at Lucky Strike Lanes in Gardner, they mm -hmm. had 10 lanes and the 10th lane was bent. The very end of it turned. And really? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. And I, you can ask anybody who ever bowled a tournament there and they knew that. And they would they would never use that 10th lane in tournaments. There was only nine lanes. So if you came in during ah. tournaments, you got stuck bowling on the one. And it, it straight up bent up just a little bit. Awesome, Mike. Well, I really appreciate the time. And, um, and just for your book, uh, what's the best way for people to pick up a copy of that? They can just uh, reach out to me. Um, it, it, it's on Amazon, but, but they run out because they don't always send them enough copies. So they could go to, uh, uh, they could email me at mikemorinmedia at gmail.com. Mike Morin, M-I-K-E-M-O-R-I-N at uh, uh, media at gmail.com. Awesome. All right, Mike. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, Ricky. Great questions. Great concept. And I definitely look forward to, uh, to seeing, you know, what, what you do with everything. 